Welcome to episode 198 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 10th of October 2022. I'm Joe, and with me are Fainim. Howdy. Graham. Hello, everyone. And Will. Hello. I've got nothing funny to say, so let's get straight on with the news. <laughs> In a shock to literally no one, Stadia is shutting down. Hey. I'm honestly shocked that it outlived the Queen, to be honest, <laughs> and not at all surprised by this. They are going to refund everyone's hardware and software purchases, though. That was quite a surprise to me. And there's even rumours of them unlocking the controller so that you'll be able to pair it via Bluetooth to your computer, which is, well, unproven and unlikely. But if they did do that, that's quite amazing. Yeah, and worst case scenario, you can still use it via USB, which is a bit clunky, but it was free. What are you going to do? Yeah, quite. I think I paid tens of pounds, not very much money at all, for the controller in the first place. And it came with a Chromecast thing. And now they're going to give me my money back. This almost <laughs> makes up for the death of Google Reader and trying to make me pay for Gmail. <laughs> Don't accept it. They're trying to buy you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the same as well. I think we talked about it. We spent like £22 on the controller and the Chromecast. Um, the controller is brilliant. And that's why it'd be nice to keep it going. Ergonomically, I really like it. Chromecast is useful. And I think it says it all about Stadia that I never used my three months free trial. <laughs> <laughs> you and a lot of other people. I did try to use it. I thought I got it out of the box and, and looked at it for a little while. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give this thing a go. Maybe it, it will surprise me. Maybe it will work and I'll, I'll enjoy using it. And I plugged it all in and tried to get it set up. And I just couldn't get the bloody thing to work. I didn't try very hard, but I sh nor should I have tried very hard. Like, it should have just been plug and play. Got it all working, discovered that it wanted me to pay for literally everything, and, um, and, and finally gave up. So if that's my experience, and I wanted to give it a go, I think that most people will be in a similar boat and would have just given up with it. It was just always doomed to failure, though, wasn't it? Because we know that Google has this reputation for cancelling projects and products, no one was willing to invest in it because they knew that it would get cancelled, and that became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so it begs the question, what can Google do in the future to avoid this sort of thing happening again? Is it that people are wary of investing in Google products, or is it that this product was just never fit for the sort of audience that they expected? I don't know anybody who thought that remote play of first-person shooters was going to be acceptable. I've got no proof whether it was or not. I didn't get that far. But I don't know. It, I think there's a trade-off in thought here between this product is going to be cancelled because it's Google and this product was never going to work in the first place, so we're going to stay away from it. I don't quite know where to come down on that. those two points. Well, other companies have made something of a success of game streaming, like NVIDIA have got their one. And loads of other people are relatively successful. At least they haven't shit canned it like Google has. One of the big problems, I know there were different subscription tiers, but having to buy the actual game that then lived only in Google's cloud was just, I mean, I, I think a lot of us hate subscription models anyway. I'll try anything I can to avoid it. But at least an on-demand gaming service like Netflix, I can kind of see the lure of it. Um, but actually having to buy, spend 50 or $60 on a title and then you don't own it and then you can only play it through this format, it seems bonkers. I mean, if you could play it on your PC, install it on your Steam Deck and stream it to your phone if you happen to be on the train, then fine. But that just one thing and then the potential to lose it when Google does what it always does and closes it, it's just too much of a risk. But you would still have to factor in that every time they release a new product, we always joke about it. Mm. But I don't think we're the only ones joking about the fact that it's going to die. And we all know that there is a huge list on that web page that has them all. That how would you invest in any single thing they ever do? They need to build backup trust. They need to make Gmail more accessible. They need to improve my G Drive storage to 100 gigabytes without any costing me any more money. <laughs> this sounds very specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they need to basically do more for us that subsidize their core engine, which is search. What about me, though? <laughs> <laughs> well, you would happily pay for all that external well, now storage. What? If they just took my money and didn't take all my information, I'd be all right with that. That would be a product I could accept to pay for. 
but even you, I don't think, would trust them or believe them if if they said, "Yeah, yeah, we're not scanning your stuff at all." Wouldn't you much rather use somebody you might have more trust in? Absolutely. And would I want to start like relying on them as a remote storage location for anything worth putting up there? That's the other thing. Like, what if that just goes away one day and they give you like two weeks to download your terabytes of data? Like, well, if it's just one of your many offsite backups, then that's fine. Yes, because real people work like that, don't they? They all have like their own home NAS where they're they're backupping stuff to. It just doesn't happen. I'm t- I'm realistically thinking of real people, and you know they don't even know or care how this works. It's just oh yeah, my pictures are on my phone, which Google has a copy of that I get on my new phone. And if you can't even rely on that type of stuff, where does it lead to? Well, I think that they have allayed my fears when it comes to the Google Photos thing by charging you for it you only get a certain amount of free storage now and that's good that means that they're taking it seriously and actually trying to make some money out of it hopefully i still don't know whether i believe them though the person is still the thing that they profit the most from you know whatever it's machine learning on your information whether it's answering captures if it's the search queries that they dominate i don't know if i trust anything around like i think those core bits they make their money on i think everything else is just window dressing Well, all that aside, what does this all mean for Linux? Because that's why we're talking about it. This thing ran on Linux on the back end. Has it been a positive, a negative, or inconsequential to Linux as a whole? Inconsequential. Yeah, I agree. I'm not aware of anything that has made Linux better. I might be wrong on that, but I'm not aware of it, and I would have thought that we would have heard about it. And it's certainly not Linux's fault that they made a really bad business decision. What really strikes me about this is how quickly the decision was made. Because even last month, there were articles about new games coming to Stadia. And it looks like a lot of the developers working on games didn't find out about this until it went public. So the plug was pulled simultaneously very quickly, but also over the last year or so, it seems. Because the the, the hints were there. But the final decision seems to have come very, very quickly. Was the hint it was made by Google? Well, that was the original hint. But then there was talk of them white labeling the service. And, you know, we've reported on various developments with this. And and the writing has been on the wall for a long time. But they kept saying, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And then, no, it's not. And that further erodes trust in Google to not just shit can stuff. I think they've got a serious problem. I think so too, because whatever they bring out, we're all going to say it. We're all going to say, oh, how long is that going to last? Or which team is competing against which other team for the same type of thing? And, you know, yet another chat app comes out. I'm not sure Google's got a serious problem yet. I don't want to be geeky about it, but I don't think they particularly care about the humans in this equation. (laughs) They're just throwing stuff at the wall in the hope that it'll fix and stick in their world, in their world of gathering data and and winning new avenues for their APIs. This will just be another endpoint that they have to cancel. And the AI that is Google these days, I think, will just adjust and try something else. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash late night Linux, support the show and get $100 free credit. From their award-winning support, offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace, or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. And check out their managed MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB databases that allow you to quickly deploy a new database and defer management tasks like configuration, managing high availability, disaster recovery, backups, and data replication. Simple and fast to deploy with secure access, their flexible plans include daily backups. So go to linode.com slash late night Linux, create a free account, and you'll get $100 in credit and support the show. That's linode.com slash late night Linux. Canonical has launched free Ubuntu Pro subscriptions for up to five machines for individuals or small companies. And so what that means is you can get 10 years of support for up to five machines for free. And that's not just Ubuntu main anymore. This is all the packages, including Universe. 
I'm getting to feel that canonical don't actually like my money because <laughs> I've I've a client that has four servers and we've paid for support because they were sitting back at a, a much further version. I think it was 1604 for a good while because uh, websites had to be upgraded and upgraded along and the place was very happy to pay for that. I can't remember what the name of the license was, but it was a VM license. It was about, I think, $250 per machine. And they were happy with that. And it was fine. But uh, this would cover that. So I I just don't get it anymore. (laughs) Well, in the press release for it, they talk about the commitment to community and all that. And it's a pretty straightforward business model, isn't it? It's, you know, give them the first taste for free and then charge them loads of money once, once they're hooked. I think it's going to struggle to find traction in the home user market because software developers, which probably make up a significant portion of desktop users, always want the latest and greatest of everything to the point where they would seemingly rather pipe a script downloaded from the internet straight into Bash than they would install a package from some sort of package manager. So I don't know. I I don't think home users will find this valuable and they won't really understand the the benefit of this why it's being given to them this way but anybody in a business situation who can go and deploy an ubuntu server and set up automatic updates and know that for the next 10 years any significant security flaws in not only apache or mysql or something but all of the myriad of packages in all of universe are also going to get updated automatically is extremely valuable and um, so yeah maybe that will carry through into their their in uh, working in larger enterprises that need to pay for more than five but i don't know this this doesn't seem like a, it seems like a bit of a lost leader that's not actually going to lead anywhere <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i've ever mentioned this before but i use arch and, uh, <laughs> no it's never come up <laughs> my security policy is to update so regularly i keep ahead of the zero day vulnerabilities so. <laughs> I take your point, Will, and I don't think there's many of us home users who are looking to hang around. I mean, I'm still on 20 or 4 on my main work machine, but I can't see me hanging around long enough to need this. I could see some server situations, VPSs or whatever, where it's just easier to sign them up to this. You keep meaning to upgrade it and you just never get around to it. And maybe in small businesses... You might be looking to just test this out and see what it's like and try before you buy almost. So maybe in that sense, it's worth it. Or maybe it's just about the headlines, just about getting headlines that they actually do care about the community. Because as we know, there's been talk in the community that they don't care about them. And so maybe that's the the calculation here, that not many people are actually going to take advantage of this. It's not really going to cost them anything extra because the work isn't distributing the updates, is it? The work is maintaining those updates in the first place. So it could just be a cynical ploy to appear to be friendly to the community. I also saw that Amazon Workspaces has introduced Ubuntu desktops. So this is Amazon's remote desktop solution. And now you can get Ubuntu on there. And this comes with the Ubuntu Pro as part of the price. So you get 10 years of support with it. I think that it kind of all ties into Canonical trying to become a very serious enterprise player, which they need to do in order to IPO or get acquired. I've been following the Ubuntu blog, and we don't cover it very often, but almost everything on there seems to line up with this idea that they're just trying to be taken seriously like Red Hat or Sousa. Well, I think the thing is, supposedly, according to Azure, and even AWS, they're the most prolific install there. So, I mean, I think they already are, but maybe it's just not sort of making any money for them because, you know, if it goes up there and it works, what else do you do with it? Yeah, exactly. But if they can offer this 10 years of support and charge people for it, then there's a business model there, a monthly recurring revenue or annual recurring revenue model. I do kind of hate the long-term support on some stuff I would wish that software vendors could be in a position that they could upgrade things nicely and we could all just move along rather than setting these big don't touch this box for the next 10 years sort of things. But that is the reality, isn't it? That's the reality of of IT. 
Oh, it, it, look, it absolutely is. Yeah, I know. I've been there. I have not upgraded loads of stuff, but uh, I just wish it wasn't the case. Mm. <laughs> I wish we could make upgrades, you know, safer. Maybe that's where the uh, the likes of the, you know, A-B testing and stuff like that can come in and uh, read only parts of the file system. What's the oldest installation that you're looking after then? I did have a 1404 one, but that's gone. That upgraded all the way to 2004, I think, was the last point I stopped with it. But I did have a, a fair few 1604s that were there with the LTS support on us. And yeah, most things, yeah, just gets upgraded along and it's fine. The upgrade process is so good as well. And I think that's a trick that Red Hat missed for so long, not being able to do upgrades in place because I don't care what you say. Loads of companies can't afford to just have a brand new server waltz in there every two years and just go, oh, yeah, now we're on this server. It just doesn't happen, especially if it's with advanced kit, like 5,000 pound network cards or whatever, or, you know, telephony stuff or whatever. You just can't have multiples too much because you have your two live ones and yeah, okay, you might have a dev one if you're lucky. All right, the first Risk Five laptop is available. Now, this has had a bit of publicity. I'm incredibly skeptical about it. Phelan, you are less skeptical, it seems. Well, <laughs> I think it might exist. I mean, I'm not saying whether it's going to come to your delivery, if you do, but it seems like it's more plausible than it was when they first came out with it. Like, it doesn't sound like they actually have some specs there and stuff. It does sound shockingly expensive for what it is, but hey, I mean... If this is the future and this is the sort of expensive tip of the purchasing spear, then yeah, I guess that's what you can kind of expect. I'm not sure I like the idea of the new ARM Risk V world where, you know, one processor to the next is as incompatible as a Commodore 64 to a, a BBC or whatever, but it's a start. Yeah, so this thing starts at $1,500 and goes up to 5000 I think. And it's not a particularly beefy machine either now. Yeah, it's got 16 gigs of RAM. I'm not sure how powerful the uh, the processor part of the SOC is. I tried to look it up, and it seems to be too new for most people to know what it's going to actually perform like. Yeah, Michael Larabelle's busy compiling his uh, Fronix test suite away, I'd say. Yeah. I am very skeptical. You can only buy this from Alibaba, and whether it's actually going to turn up after you send them your $1,500, who knows? That is very skeptical of you. <laughs> it is very skeptical of me, but you know, there's no retail experience here. Are you telling me you can't trust people on the internet with a random amount of large quantities of money? No, I'm sure it'd be absolutely fine. I mean, look, if this was $150 or $200 or even $300, then maybe... I might be willing to take the risk, but fuck no, at 1500 Yeah, <laughs> it is a lot of cash. You could buy a lot of nice laptop with that money. Yeah, probably you could buy yourself an M2 at this point, could you? Yeah, you could definitely buy an Air for 1500 I would say. Not that I'm recommending that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you could buy all sorts of hardware for that kind of money. The case looks suspiciously like a relatively new ThinkPad, and the keyboard close-up on the Alibaba advert, they've changed the Windows key for a Risk Five key, which looks pretty badly Photoshopped to my eye. <laughs> so I'm not convinced that, that this these pictures are representative of the final product. It'd be nice if it was, but I'm, I'm not going to risk it. Not even going to risk five it. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems very odd to me that if you go for the premium one, which is $5,000, you, you get various gifts, including what looks like a games controller, some headphones, some really old school 3D glasses, a car, <laughs> some <laughs> speakers, a watch. <laughs> Do you get a, a set of knives that can cut through a tomato <laughs> after they have cut through a chain link fence, though? That's what I want to know. Yeah, and, and you get some, oh, maybe the car one is like uh, polish where you can scratch the car with a nail. And then set it on fire and it's still fine afterwards. Yeah, then you just use this special polish and then it's fine, yeah. Hmm, maybe that's what it's about. <laughs> that is unintelligible. What are they saying? <laughs> <laughs> They're saying you get sweet free gifts with your $5,000 laptop. <laughs> <laughs> it's not available in the shops. Call now. <laughs> That is the uh, Alibaba equivalent of wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm just not convinced. You can order them in acres. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what acres? Scroll down to the bottom of the page. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like one <laughs> acre of laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. Traditional endpoint security tools can make your workplace feel like a surveillance state, turn users and the IT team into adversaries, and ultimately drive your employees to work on unsecured personal devices. It doesn't have to be this way. Collide is a device security solution built around honest security. Their philosophy is that employees aren't your biggest security risk, they're your biggest allies, and your relationship with them should be based on transparency and informed consent. Collide works by notifying your employees of security issues via Slack and giving them step-by-step instructions on how to resolve them themselves. For IT and security teams, Collide provides the right level of visibility for Mac, Windows and Linux devices. It can answer questions about your fleet security that traditional MDMs can't. You can meet your security goals without compromising your values. Visit collide.com slash late night Linux to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash late night Linux. Well, in much more positive gaming news, the Steam Deck is now available with no reservations required. And it looks like Valve have shipped over a million Steam Decks. That is according to David Edmondson, a KDE dev who did a talk at Academy. And there's a YouTube video of that that we can link to where he just casually says that they've shipped over a million units. I had no idea that they'd shipped that many units. That's amazing. Have you got one yet, Joe? No, I tried at the weekend to get a a secondhand one, but the guy ghosted me. So uh, that was the end of that. Because I'm not paying full price for something that I'm just going to install XFCE on and have a shit time. <sighs> I mean, I could try and play games on it, but I don't, I've barely got time to play my guitars. So, like, how am I going to play games? I just want to play Mega Drive emulators on it, which it seems massive overkill for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not only amazed that they've shipped over a million units, I'm astounded that they've shipped them during a chip shortage. How are they getting enough components to build these things? Well done, however they're doing it. It's very impressive. Um, you know, during this time, we're finding, we're, we're hearing about shortages and cost rises and all of that stuff. And here they are shipping these quietly out to people. And now they're saying you can just order them when you want one. Amazing. Just in time for Christmas. <laughs> mm. They must have done a good deal with AMD, is all I can say, to get priority. My household even has two now. Oh, and everybody else here had switches. And people are preferring to play with the Steam Deck than the Switch. I think because there's more choice, it's also much cheaper to get games that are kind of those quirky, interesting indie games that maybe other people who aren't into FPSs like to play. And it's been a lot of fun. I've been playing two-player games with my daughters. Yeah, what can I say? I think it's brilliant. I think it's a brilliant device. And there's no chance that I want to install Windows on it. The uh, the Linux experience on that is seamless. You don't even know. And the performance seems great. It's kind of what you want from it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, even I often reduce the power load to the GPU to try and get battery life out of it because battery life is the big problem. But I'll forget that I've reduced the performance of the device and don't notice for ages unless I'm playing something like uh, Cyberpunk or Deep Rock Galactic. So, yeah, it's just an amazing device. Debian chooses a reasonable common sense solution to dealing with non-free firmware, according to Michael at Phronix. So we've been watching this for a while and now we've got results. Debian were voting on what to do about their ISOs because it's a horrible mess at the moment. You download the Debian ISO and your fucking hardware doesn't work generally. Your network card, graphics card, whatever. Unless you dig through and find the non-free ISOs, in which case things work. Well, they have debated it and voted on it and come to a very sensible solution. And that is that they're going to change the Debian social contract to include a sentence that says the Debian official media may include firmware that is otherwise not part of the Debian system to enable the use of Debian with hardware that requires such firmware. So I'm fairly surprised that they have made this very sensible, pragmatic decision. But well done. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) It's certainly not the Debian I'd have expected of, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, but I like it. Yeah, I mean, same. I think if anybody is going to, go looking for Debian 
and they install it and things work. I think that's a win. If somebody is looking for free software and they want to install Debian, they'll go looking for the only open binaries and stuff like that. There's distros that are there specifically for being completely open, uh, the likes of Triskel and things like that. Free, Phantom Command, free. Free, sorry, I, <laughs> I do apologize. Yeah, and Debian was kind of that, but then they did have the non-free repos, so they, they didn't make the uh, the recommendation list for FSF or whatever. So why not just be more sensible like this? And it looks like they're going to include options, you know, boot options to disable the non-free stuff, which seems like a good compromise to me. Hmm. I'd rather people were to stumble into Debian and enjoy using Debian than to go, Jesus, what the hell is this? <laughs> By accidentally downloading the completely free version of the ISO and nothing works. Phelan, what happens if they stumble into it on WSL? <laughs> <laughs> then I hope their machine goes on fire. <laughs> <laughs> hope it trashes the microcode in the processor. <laughs> Formats the firmware and the hard drive. <laughs> Bastards. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Entroware. Go to entroware.com. Entroware sells computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate pre-installed. They've got a range of desktops, laptops, and servers, and most parts are configurable, so you can pick the CPU, RAM, and storage that's right for you. If you can't find exactly what you want, then do contact them, and they'll work with you on a bespoke solution that's perfect for your needs. They ship to the UK, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And if you do buy one of their machines, there's a little drop down at checkout and you can select late night Linux so they'll know that we sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. Let's do a quick KDE corner then. The first one is videos from Academy. Yeah, I didn't find broken out videos, but day one, it's a giant big eight hour long video and day two is pretty much the same, but they're all time stamped in the first comment so people can jump between them and there's some great stuff in there. Uh, the new goals, the accessibility, sustainability software, and then the automate everything one. There's that Steam talk. There's uh, the new Plasma project. If you're creating a new one, that was a great one by Alish. He had uh, where, you know, deciding whether you're going to start a new thing like Plasma Mobile or the sort of uh, 10 foot one that I can't remember what it's called. Big screen. Plasma big screen. That's yeah. the one, yeah. Whether you do that or whether you actually just have a version of a theme that actually can do it as well. It's quite good. Very interesting. Hector Martin was on the second day as well. That was quite interesting. He's been using KDE for 20 odd years, apparently, and the stuff that he's done to get things working. And then there's loads of stuff like things on console, even healthy mind stuff, KD6. And there's even a funny one, which I thought was quite good, was the open voice OS, where the audio was broken in the video. They tried to play it the very first couple of minutes, and that was quite entertaining. <laughs> and you were obviously very conflicted watching... Uh hector talk about all his kde use no on max no not at all that's fine <laughs> it's all good <sighs> all right and there's been some write-ups of the various academy stuff there has yeah um one was nate talking about his goal to automate everything and that was quite good because that was to take away the onus on people being sort of the weakest link and if they you know get run over by a bus or whatever and or hassled and burnt out is to, you know, email a team, automate all the stuff as much as possible and lots of automatic QA scripts and things like that. So I think that'll be quite good. Then there was also the buffs where they had various things like the QT6 people at the start of 2023, Plasma 527, which will be a LTS will be out. And that is the last QT5 version. So that'll be interesting. From then on, it's QT6 only. Mm. Uh, they talked about app stores, charging money, how they're going to solve that, how they're going to differentiate the fact that if some apps are free on the Windows Store right now and you kind of can't switch that to payment. And uh, an interesting thing was there was translations were broken on user base, which is kind of like the user wiki, and they've all been sorted out and they did work on that and they're trying to improve the whole translation thing. So if you have a skill with a language and you want to help out, that would be a great place to start. And an interesting thing that we were talking about Risk Five or Risk V, Neon is decided that they are going to start doing a version of Risk Five for the uh, for the distro. So I think that's quite interesting. Mm. And they did a test of moving to twenty two oh four as a base, which broke during the buff. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy for them to continue not releasing that yet. But when they do release the Neon based on twenty two oh four, it's going to have the Firefox PPA and not the Snap. After they did a Twitter poll, which I think we talked about, 
uh, which was rather in favor of the PPA instead of the snap. Yeah, it was. And I'd actually enable that myself by default, but then it was a different one that got enabled, but did the same package, I think. So yeah, I just removed the thing I did and went with theirs. So I think that's the way to go. At least it doesn't break anything for people and stuff like that. So Although it's funny that the tweet we'll link to announcing this, the first reply is, why not the Firefox flat pack? <laughs> well, I think flat packs are as equally broken for things like plugins and, you know, accessing things outside of home directories. So I'm not totally sure that that would have been any better. Mm. All right. Overhaul of contact encryption. Just to promote the fact that contact still gets a lot of work on it. And I think it's quite good. And they're working on things like GPG and uh, encryption of emails or signing of emails, whatever. And the extra work they're trying to do to clean that up to improve some of the usability. Because when you, once you click send an email, it actually has to do a lot of things, whether, you know, whether it's signing it or encrypting it or whatever and the trust levels of keys. And they're working away on that. They've still a big long to do list of things that they want to add to it. But I think it's improvements all the way. So I think it's just good to highlight that. Okay, me too, Bo, I think it is ads feeds. Yeah, this, so this is a sort of non-browser-based way of accessing YouTube, and it's not unlike Newpipe. And I just thought if people were interested in this, I, I can obviously see that this is probably aimed more at the Plasma Mobile, but nothing stops you using it on your own machine. And if you're also fed up getting forced the, do you want to try out YouTube music? No, I really don't. Stop. Uh, this is a good way to do it. Nice. All right, well, we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back next week when we'll have some discoveries and feedback and all sorts of stuff. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later. <laughs>